Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor here. And I got to tell you, I am uniquely excited about today's episode because uh, today's guest is, I knew him before he was a star, although I may not have known him too well. I remember back, it was early 2011. I had just had written a draft of my first book and I was, I was looking to reach out in the industry and get some support. And I was able to contact this, uh, get in touch with this, this, this doctor that at the time, you know, he was a great guy doing great work, but you know, it wasn't a nationally renowned spokesperson or anything. And he was kind enough to provide a blurb, blurb for my book. And then here he is today, author of two wildly, wildly successful New York Times bestselling books, whose message I love and wholeheartedly support. We've got folks, none other than Dr. William Davis, the the Wheat Belly Doctor, the author of Wheat Belly and the Wheat Belly Cookbook. Dr. Davis, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Well, I'm it's glad to be here. Dr. Davis, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. And again, thank you for your support of my work before you were famous and 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 all the work you're doing now that you are famous. And that's really, Dr. Davis, the first question I wanted to ask you is I, you know, since we we connected very casually many, many years ago, I'm a big fan of your work. I've been following your work. And I'm a little curious. I'd love to hear the inside scoop from the author's perspective of the roller coaster ride that you've been on with Wheat Belly. To my knowledge, the book came out and was doing well for about a year, but then it, something happened because then it just went crazy. What do, can you could you take us on that roller coaster ride with you a little bit? You know, Jonathan, I, I'm impressed you followed this that closely, but I, I, I saw that same thing happen. I think I I I can only guess what happened. I think it's because people started to, it's the whole social media viral discussion kind of a thing. That is, people started to tell each other what was happening. So when somebody loses 43 pounds in three or four months and loses four inches off their waist and their rheumatoid arthritis is gone for the first time in 10 years and acid reflux is gone and rashes are gone, depression lifts, and they tell their neighbor, their doctor, they tell their family, <clears throat> they can't, people can't help but notice. And they say, Mary, you look 20 years younger. I think that's what happened. And it spread like crazy. We saw our social media following uh, explode. I, I don't think it was me. I think it was the message. I think it was the experiences people were having. And that's what's continuing to drive this. Thing. Jonathan, it's, 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 it's not my media appearances. It's not my spectacular good looks or winning smile. I think it's, it's <laughs> Maybe the, it's uh, both. Maybe it's both. <laughs> I think it's the it's the message and the success is because I, I go on my Facebook page for Wheat Belly, for instance, or the blog, and every day, every day, there are new stories of people with new lessons learned, new incredible health stories to tell. So getting incredible stories to tell is is is, is very easy now. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, and, and certainly, Dr. Davis, for those few people left in the world who are not familiar with your book, and again, the book is Wheat Belly, and, and if you haven't picked up a copy, um, Go run to the bookstore because they are likely selling out as we speak. The the uh, Dr. Davis, can you tell us uh, the the basic premise of the book and of your years of research and clinical practice? Sure. So it's it's important for newcomers to this uh, conversation to know that the wheat we're sold today is not the wheat that our mothers or grandmothers had. It is the product of extensive genetic research and uh, manipulations such that modern wheat is not the four and a half or five foot tall traditional plant we think of. It is an 18 to 24 inch high yield semi-dwarf strain that looks very different. It's got a large seed head, large seeds, the stalk is short and squat. Now they did this for purposes of increased yield, but they changed, they inadvertently changed multiple characteristics of this plant and its effects on humans. So this thing was invented in the 70s, but really reached store shelves in the early to mid 80s. And that's when we saw an, a, a whole host of new problems appear, such as appetite stimulation. This thing stimulates appetite. There's a protein in modern wheat that has been changed called gliadin. Gliadin has been present ever since wheat's been around for thousands and thousands of years. But this gliadin is different. It's different by several amino acids, and it's now an opiate that stimulates appetite, binds the opiate receptors of the human brain, and causes us to take in, on average, 400 more calories per day every day. And that's exactly what's happened. We've watched the consequences of increased calorie uh, consumption. We get fat. We grow it around our tummies. We become diabetic. We suffer inflammatory conditions. Uh, and you know the rest of the story. Oh, absolutely. Well, and, and Dr. Davis, one thing that I, I've been curious of is during 
all the research you did for this around wheat. How, did you find other? Because I've got to imagine, and I, I've I've heard some rumblings of this, but I haven't had uh, the ability to do the research myself around other foods that have had this same fate. For example, apples. I've heard now again, I cannot confirm this that for example, the percent fructose found in modern apples and the percent of vitamins is dramatically lower, not for, for similar reasons to wheat, not the exact same, but for similar reasons than say the apples we ate 60 years ago. Did you find other foods like that? Yeah, you know, you make a crucial point, Jonathan. That's exactly right. So people say, oh, wheat belly is just a low-carb diet. No, 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 no. This is not about carbs. It's not about fat or calories. It's about what agribusiness has been doing to food. So it could be wheat. It could be apples. It could be oats. It could be corn. Corn's mm. a big, right? Soy. In other words, we can't just talk about calories and fats and, and, and carbohydrates. We've got to be aware that agribusiness is busily changing our foods. It could be high yield semi dwarf wheat. It could be glyphosate resistant corn or BT toxin inoculated corn. It could be strains of apples chosen for their higher fructose content and the shortcuts taken to, for higher yield such that we have lower uh, magnesium and other nutrients in apples and broccoli and spinach. So it, we have to be aware now, part of the necessary conversation in nutrition has to be an awareness of what agribusiness has been doing and the trends that are emerging in agriculture that affect our lives and our health. Dr. Davis, and I personally think that is a big reason why your book was, I mean, obviously it's very entertaining. There's wonderful research. You have a wonderful, uh, wonderful writing style that is very fun and engaging. But I think the thing that really hits home, at least when I talk about your work to other people is, for example, and I know you hear this argument all the time is, well, you know, people ate, my grandmother ate wheat and her grandmother ate wheat. So, so how can you say that like wheat is the problem? And in the Bible, they ate wheat and they didn't have so like, clearly it's got to be something else. And, and as you explained so well, well, okay. We're not actually eating the same, like we are, it's not even, we should call it a different food. Like, frankly, we like call it franken wheat, call it something else, right? <laughs> exactly. That's right. The wheat we have today is nothing like the wheat of 40 years ago. And it's, it's far, far, far different than say the wheat of the Bible. So I, I, I make this comparison. So all humans uh, of all colors, all sizes, all shapes, nationalities, all of us have 46 chromosomes from six foot three Maasai tribesmen to four foot uh, two Mabuti pygmies. <laughs> so all 46 chromosomes and orangutan, by the way, 48, but just two chromosomes different. You and I can tell the difference right away. <laughs> modern, modern wheat has 42 chromosomes. The wheat of the Bible has 28 chromosomes. Ancient wheat before even the Bible has 14 chromosomes. We're not talking about a little bit of difference. We're talking about worlds of difference. So that's why people say I have to eat bread. It's in the Bible. I'm told I have to. It's part of my ritual, part of uh, taking the sacrament, all that sort of thing. Yeah, but it ain't the stuff you got. The stuff you have is worlds different than the stuff mentioned in the Bible and the stuff that grew in ancient times. And, and Dr. Davis, what what are we to do here? Because I can imagine some of my listeners. So there's there's a couple things here. So it's like step one, is, and and this is a big step, right? There's 90 percent plus of the population still has not uh, had had the opportunity or the knowledge given to them to take this step, and that is eat non like just don't eat edible products. Like don't eat Cheetos and garbage. I mean, e eat things that bear some resemblance to actual food. So then they do that. Then they do that. And they're like, good. Like I'm eating whole wheat. Like I am, I'm eating food now. And then you're like, damn it. It's not actually, and then it's just like, oh man, it's like, if I'm not doing this, I'm getting hit by this. And then there's pesticides and oh, what are we to do? <laughs> well, that, that's right. You know, I, I don't want to make people neurotic about their food because, you know, we, we should enjoy our food. We should sit down with our families and enjoy food. But we have to return to real single ingredient foods. The recipients of most of the genetic manipulations of the last 40, 50 years have been the grains. They have changed vegetables and fruit, but really it's the grains, and in particular, the high-yield monocrop grains, the stuff that grows on 10, 20,000 acres, huge tracts of land. So, Jonathan, it, it's astounding to think now that 50% of all human calories, 50% worldwide, now come from wheat, corn, and soy. Mm -hmm. The three monocrops that are controlled by big agribusiness, that is these big companies that have uh, uh, 
unimaginable revenues, 80 to $120 billion a year that spend billions of dollars every quarter to lobby Congress, the Senate, the USDA, the FDA, and they get their way. They are, sad to say, winning this battle unless all of us say, we're not going to stand for this. We're going to vote with our wallets and pocketbooks. We're going to become aware what these people are doing for the purposes of their own agenda, that is increase yield, increase revenue, and we're going to not buy their foods. We're going to buy real single ingredient foods. We're going to buy cucumbers and green peppers and avocados and meats, hopefully organic and uh, pasture fed. We're going to eat real food, the least adulterated, least changed by agribusiness. And Dr. Davis, I think that is such a key point because you you also do a very good job. I actually think it was you. I was listening to you on another podcast, and I think it was you that introduced me to the term orthorexic. Which is, and if I'm wrong, I'll just give you credit for free here. But I think it was you <laughs> because you you actually do a good job of you know certain people are like oh well if I eat meat what about this and if I eat this what about this and it's you're right you know wheat corn soy added sugars like if you could just avoid those man would you be in a better place and and if you want to take it further that's fine but don't make yourself neurotic at the same time because that's not healthy either right. It, it, very well said. That's a, if if all people did was remove those three, uh, they are they've solved ninety percent of nutritional problems. So diet doesn't have to be perfect. You're absolutely right. The, that's the biggest source of problems. And the, the problem, of course, is those things are in virtually everything, every processed food. So I, and a lot of it's for taste, texture, shelf life, and those kinds of food science reasons. Wheat, by the way, I think is there because of that appetite stimulating effect. You know, if you have, if you're a big food company and you figured out that modern wheat contains this opiate, that uh, gl this gliadin protein of wheat, and you can get your consumers to consume 400 more calories per day and be helpless consumers of junk carbohydrates, well, you're going to put it in everything. So we find wheat in Twizzlers in Campbell's tomato soup and Lipton instant soup and all frozen dinners and salad dressings and all breakfast cereal. In other words, it's, you, you'll be hard pressed to find any processed food without it. So it is a, a dietary approach that tries to eliminate all processed foods. And Dr. Davis, it really is s scary and a perfect storm of sorts because you're exactly right. These in these foods, it's, it's usually not just wheat. Like they've got wheat and then they've got added sugars, which clinical research is now showing does a similar uh, opiate type morphine heroin response in the brain. And then you've got your processed fats in there, which destroy your hypothalamus's ability to regulate appetite. And you're just like from all angles, it's like scorched earth in here. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would agree. That's right. <laughs> so we get but we get back to single ingredient foods. We get back to eating foods and not focusing so much on the calories either, right? Because then, I mean, what's next, Dr. Davis? We got these. Well, it's it's okay, Dr. Davis, that it's 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 wheat because it's a hundred calorie snack pack and it's in <laughs> moderation. It's moderation, Dr. Right? It's just every actually. I have to, I I'm so glad I remember this. I watched you on a talk show. And you did your spiel and it was brilliant and it was all science backed. And then you walked off stage and the anchor turns to the camera and says, right, it's all about moderation. And I could imagine you were backstage <laughs> being like, that's not at all. What, what the hell are you talking about? That's the opposite of what I just said. Yeah. It, it, had, had he said it to my face, I would have said, no, moderation kills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk, talk about the myth of moderation a little bit, Dr. Davis. Well, it's like saying if you smoke moderately, you're okay. <laughs> the notion of moderation is silly. And, you know, I think the effects of foods like wheat and then secondarily corn and soy have been exaggerated. So it's not that we're eating natural, wild-growing wheat. We're not. We're eating something that's completely different, just like modern corn. It's not maize. It's not teosinte, the stuff that grew wild in Mesoamerica and South America. It is this ultra hybridized, genetically modified, now with its very own insecticide built in, as well as viral genomes built into the genetic code of the plant, as well as glyphosate residues. 
And so th this is something entirely different. And so it's naive, I think, as you know, Jonathan, to think that, oh, it's just a grain. No, it's something that has been changed extensively. It is a Franken grain. It is the product of extensive genetic manipulations. The geneticists often act as if they are conducting sophisticated research. And it is sophisticated, but it's still incredibly crude. They cannot control multiple facets. That's why there was a recent publication that showed that the viral genome, the vector used to insert a gene into the Bt toxin corn, inadvertently gets that viral genome inserted into the corn's genetics and it gets, gets expressed. So we don't know what that means. We have no idea what that means when humans eat Bt toxin inoculated corn. And so we have all these unexpected, uncertain effects. They have no idea. And of course, they're given carte blanche, this kind of do what you think you need to do from the USDA and FDA. There's a blind eye turned to all this. And yet we are the unwitting experimental rats in this massive experiment. They sell it to us. We look at each other and say, well, gee, Jonathan, why do I have bowel problems? Why do I have skin rashes and joint pain? I thought I was healthy and doing all the right things. Yet I have all these health problems. It's not you. It's the food. Absolutely, Dr. Davis. And the thing that breaks my heart is that we... <sighs> When when we are literally being prescribed, I mean that's I mean you, you're the first person to say like healthy whole grains is literally an oxymoron. So it's like <laughs> oh, my health is suffering. Well, you need to eat more whole grains. That's a bit like I, I mean I, I can't even think of a good analogy. Talk about that. <laughs> well, I I got one for you. Uh, I I I want better lung health. Well, smoking a pack of cigarettes makes you breathe deeply. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and you know that sounds. That sounds absurd, but as, as you appreciate, eat more healthy whole grains is equally absurd. It is the most god-awful, ridiculous advice you could ever possibly conceive of, particularly in this day and age when the, when the grains are changed. They're completely different. And so this notion of eat more healthy whole grains, that is the message propagated and supported by agribusiness. Uh, they want us, the USDA, by the food pyramid, food plate, they want 60% or more of our calories to come from grains. This is the most absurd, unphysiologic advice. In fact, it's the worst advice. If you and I wanted to concoct the worst possible dietary advice we could, we could come up with, it would be eat more healthy whole grains and cut your fat. So those are just this, it's an awful, awful combination of, of bad, bad advice. And it's, Again, it's another one of these multi-layered problems because, Dr. Davis, we hear so much about a plant-based diet, a plant-based diet, and certainly eating a lot of nutrient-dense vegetables and low-fructose fruits. When we're eating like the plant itself and it's nutrient-dense and it hasn't been turned into a genetic mutation, like that's good. But let's keep in mind that like, for example, we aren't eating sugar cane. We are <laughs> not eating wheat stalks like first you got a genetically mutated plant then you take it and it's processed even these whole like no if you ate sugar cane you'd probably be all right because the amount of sugar cane you could conceivably eat in a day would be be okay but that's not it's again it's that one two punch right yes eating foods in a natural form it, well said exactly Going back as far as close as we can get to the source, you know, that what's one of the problems you and I are not going to go out and kill wild animals, nor have our own goats and chickens. I mean, I'd love to, but it's impractical for most people, particularly in urban uh, environments. So we've got to be as connected as possible to the source of our food. It might mean uh, just a, you know, a, a little pot of herbs on your uh, windowsill in the kitchen. It might mean going to the farmer's market. It might mean trying to uh, drive out to the country now and then to take advantage of the um, vegetable stands as best you can. No one's perfect. No one's going to be living in the wild, spearing gazelle. <laughs> <laughs> so we at least have to try because if we just let ourselves become victimized by big food and big agribusiness, you're going to lose that game. They are too well. They are too strong. Too powerful. You can't fight them dollar for dollar. They control the airwaves. They control the message. They control the dietary message. It's that's how far this has gone. We know the USDA has a revolving door with big agribusiness. We know that these people have held key positions in, uh, you know, you know what company I'm talking about, um, and big food. So they are too powerful to go head to head with. So we've got to do it our own way. I, so I call this the equivalent of Arab Spring. 
we're going to tweet and Facebook and social media and blog our way and, and, and do such things as podcasts and talk our way out of this mess. When speaking of, of, of talking and protesting and taking a stand, and, and certainly you're welcome to say pass on this question, but uh, Dr. Davis, I'm curious, like you've shown a pretty bright light on some pretty big issues. H- has anyone, you know, been parked out in front of your house? Well, I mean, like, like, has there been any negative repercussions to you personally? Um, only in the media. So in, in their defense, uh, there have been no uh, personal attack. I know there have been some pokings around in my private affairs. I do know that. And, I, I, and that happened early on. Mm. Uh, and some kind of soft threats, but nothing concrete. And, and more recently, it's more taken the, uh, the kind of thing uh, as rebuttals. Those, I mean, you know what? That's okay. That's a healthy thing. If, if they just bent over and, and took it in the stomach, they, they're not doing their job. It's their job to defend their industry. And I want to hear their defenses. The peculiar thing, Jonathan, is when I've actually encountered these people on the airwaves, uh, face-to-face, head-to-head, uh, it's been like talking to children. So, you know, when this first came out, and I was, for instance, debating a PhD, professor of nutrition at a major university with, and also a director of research at a major agri- agribusiness company, I, I was kind of nervous. I thought, wow, this guy's going to have some really tough criticisms. Well, uh, I get on the phone. This is a phone debate. And he, of course, says Dr. Davis has no idea what he's talking about. H- healthy whole grains have been shown to reduce risk of colon cancer, heart disease, um, and diabetes. And the announcer says, what do you have to say to that? So I said, well, your expert has to understand that modern wheat is not the wheat of, of uh, traditional uh, four and a half, five foot tall plants. It's a 18 inch, 24 inch high yield semi dwarf strain created by genetics research. Bah, 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 bah. Absolute silence, Jonathan, silence. The expert comes back on and says, well, well, the farmers had to do that so they could see over the tops of the fields. <laughs> In other words, the experts were not aware of these issues about wheat. They didn't know about the glide in protein research from the National Institutes of Health, Jonathan. This is not some airy-fairy business. This came from the NIH. They, they, he was unaware of amylopectin A and its extravagant capacity to raise blood sugar. He didn't know that wheat germagglutinin had been changed and now is a potent bowel toxin. He didn't realize that the alpha amylase inhibitors in wheat, the new ones, were triggering allergies galore in kids. He did not know that hundreds, perhaps thousands of proteins in wheat had been changed and now have implications for health, a lot of which hasn't even been charted yet. So I can only talk about the ones that have been charted. So he was completely dumbfounded and speechless. When This is the one of the experts for the industry who is speechless when he hears these things. So uh, they have been pretty benign in their criticisms because I don't think they can answer to them. Just like tobacco. When tobacco came under fire, all they could do was lie or they could try to deceive. They would. So I've gotten this. Dr. Davis is nuts. He says that wheat is genetically modified. Well, I never said that because wheat has not been genetically modified. It's been changed by other techniques, which in many cases are bizarre and extreme and worse than genetic modification. But it has not been genetically modified. At least no commercial strain has. So uh, yes, there have been uh, um, uh, salvos back and forth in the media, but nothing beyond that. Well, and I, I, Dr. Davis, I think you hit on the, the why very well, and that's it's it's pretty difficult to debate non-controversial truth, and it's shocking how I, another story from from your media experience is one that I observed was this this very simple logical fallacy, which is like, yes, if you're eating refined grains and then you eat whole grains, that that will improve your health. Therefore, whole grains are good for you. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> and, and like, hold on. So so explain that logical fallacy. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you're well acquainted with it. And, and, and oddly, Jonathan, as you look at that logical fallacy, you see that nutritional science is largely based on that logical, that illogic. And that is if you replace something bad, such as white flour, with something less bad, whole grains, and there's an apparent health benefit, by the logic of nutrition, a whole bunch of the less bad thing is good for you. So I, as you know, I cast it in this silly light. We could, let's apply the cigarettes. If we take something bad for you, 
unfiltered cigarettes and replace them with something less bad, filtered cigarettes, and there's an apparent health benefit, then the unavoidable conclusion using the logic of nutrition is that you should smoke filtered cigarettes. <laughs> exactly. Of course, that's ridiculous, but that is the logic used over and over. It's applied to wheat. It's applied to glycemic index. It's applied to many facets of nutritional thinking. If we peel that away and get rid of that silly, uh, flawed logic, we start to see that so much, so many of the rules used in nutrition fall apart. And we're left with this kind of basic truth about nutrition. And certainly the thing that does not hold is this notion of healthy whole grains. That's an absurdity. That's a complete fallacy. And and there's there's so many of those, Dr. Davis, I found like a, a slightly different pivot on on uh, the logical fall- fallacy you just uncovered is, for example, we talk about you know, are whole grains better for you than, than refined grains? That doesn't mean they're good for you. But the other just like it's an interesting way to look at it and almost like you need an outsider to point these things out because they're, they're not being observed otherwise. Like if a, a nutrition expert in quotation says that processed grains are bad for you. Everything that is in a processed grain is still there, plus <laughs> other things. So like if a Snickers bar is bad for you and then you put a vitamin pill on top of it, that new thing is now not good. It's still got all the – you said X was bad. So if you add Y, that doesn't make X bad anymore. What are you t- – what? <laughs> yeah. There's a there's lot – you know, if we if we didn't have so much to pick on – with their flaws and fallacies. We'd have nothing to do, Jonathan. So, you know, I think there's so much discussion now about nutrition and diet because agencies like the USDA got it so god-awful wrong. So, you know, if they got it right from the start, uh, we wouldn't have all this to talk about, but they got it so wrong that we've got to talk so we all understand what's going on. And of course, I think it's going to get worse because the floodgates have been opened to agribusiness to change foods even more with fewer questions asked. The legislation has gotten worse. We have the the Proposition 37 in California falling apart because of the uh, incredible deep pockets of agribusiness and big food. So I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's certainly going to be an interesting thing, Dr. Davis, because another uh, an unfortunate thing I see happening is a bit like a, the the ninety nine percent versus one percent thing with nutrition, where you you have this one percent, if not much smaller percentage of people who are like really, really, really dialed into nutrition. I'm I'm talking about like getting local this and organic that, and just like really dialed in and taking supplements, and and they continue to create great work, kind of focused at other people like them that are that dialed into nutrition and they continue to get healthier and healthier and healthier while the other 99% is sort of like, that's too extreme. So I'm not going to listen to that because they're not into extreme. They just want to be, they just don't want to be obese and don't want to be diabetic. They don't want to be perfect. So you've got this stratification where a great deal of the population might be scared off by the almost what's perceived as the pursuit of perfection. Yeah, I think that's right. I see those people as the early adopters. So they're like the kids in line sleeping out overnight to get the newest iPad. So it's going to be a small minority, but I think they're just, they're just the start. So it'll take the rest of the world a longer time to adopt at least some of these principles. But you know, it took 40 years for the healthy whole grain message to catch on. And I, I do believe the pace of information is faster now. Mm-hmm. Everyone's learning faster. The, the, the information is spreading faster because of the internet, of course. Uh, so I think, I don't think it'll take 40 years, but it may take 20 years for more and more people. I think the last battleground, sadly, will be schools. Because so much what happens at our kids' schools is determined by the USDA school lunch policy and similar programs. And, and of course, the, uh, uh, a lot of subsidies are based on adherence to those kinds of principles. So we're going to find that we're way ahead and the kids are still eating their junk foods in the cafeteria. And so uh, lots of battles to fight. No, no, no doubt about that. Well, and Dr. Davis, I am I am hopeful as you as you sound like you are as well, because I also think that there was a time period I, I like to call the Great Nutritional Depression, where 
the, the USDA was the truth. And basically everyone accepted it, right? Like fat was bad. Starches and sugars are fine, whatever, as long as it's low in fat. And that was truth. And that was truth for at least two decades, if not longer. And eating that way, in some cases, caused irreparable damage to an entire generation. But like that will not ever be the case anymore. Like it's not possible. To, like you're saying, the internet exists now. People, there, I don't know if there is any, well, there's probably someone, it's probably a small minority now that thinks all fats are bad for you always. Like even the <laughs> least versed person is probably like, no, olive oil. I thought olive oil was good for you, was it? <laughs> you know, so, so uh -huh. I do think there is hope with, with the, the up and coming generations. I, I think you're right. Yeah, it's it's a funny thing that's so in the in the effort to control what we think, what we eat, they did the opposite, at least in the long run. They have subverted their own uh, credibility. We're going to say in in a year or two or five, no one listens to the USDA. The food pyramid food plate is an absurd pitch of agribusiness and food is an attempt to manipulate our perceptions and our thinking. No one pays attention to them. I think that's happening now. So I, I, I wish it wasn't true. I wish you and I could turn to reliable sources of information and say, you know what? They've been good. They've been reliable. They, we could count on them to be scientific and not be swayed by industry. But you know what? I don't know of anybody who's doing that now. That's, that's why what we do, what you and I do, is so necessary. We have to talk about these things. You and I have nothing to cover up. We're not selling food. We're not trying to drive agribusiness. We're just trying to understand nutrition. Uh, and you know what? I think we are having an impact. I'm sure your listeners and the people who follow the Wheat Belly message have been educated, have been grateful that there are people who are talking honestly about food and what's happening. And I, I, am, I am very grateful that uh, we have this thing called freedom of speech and we are free to bash <laughs> the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the USDA because, you know, they do good also. They try to police the quality of meat production. They, they do good, too. And we often forget that. But they have allowed many bad things to happen and they allowed too many people to do the wrong thing. And so that's what we're talking about here. And in particular, we, we I, I agree, this is the nutritional dark age. We're coming to the close the last few years, I hope, of the nutritional dark age. But this was has been truly a dark Middle Ages for, for nutritional advice. Well, certainly, Dr. Davis, you are doing your share and then some to shed light on that nutritional <laughs> dark age with, with your two wonderful New York Times bestselling books, Wheat well, Belly you, and the Wheat Belly Cookbook. And then also, folks, if you wanted to check out his online presence, there's, of course, the Wheat Belly blog, which has all sorts of wonderful resources on it. And Dr. Davis, I got to ask you, what's next? Well, the publisher uh, suggested to me a 30-minute a, a meal cookbook. Because lots of people were saying, we, we, we want to do this, but we don't have lots and lots of time to make things from scratch. Can you help us do things more quickly? So I came up with ways to try to make this a much more navigable way of life. Uh, I have a whole bunch of baking mixes and seasoning mixes and ways to make this a much quicker, on-the-run, on-the-go kind of lifestyle. And then I'm also going to be working on the follow-on to the Wheat Belly, uh, this kind of much, much bigger discussion uh, of how the wheat belly conversation fits into the whole nutritional world. Oh, fantastic. I was, I was hoping to hear something like that. Cause as you said, at the beginning of the podcast, I think wheat belly is about a lot more than just wheat. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to have a book that, that focuses on that a lot more aspect because I think you, you just, you know, that I, I saw the tip of the iceberg popping up in wheat belly and I was like, man, he's got a whole nother book. I bet <laughs> that's going to be a good one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not ready to shut up just yet, Jonathan. Oh, I'm excited for it. And certainly, certainly, I know all the listeners will be as well. Well, Dr. Davis, again, thank you for all the great work you're doing. Congratulations on the wonderful work you're doing. And I hope we can have you back. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. Absolute pleasure. Well, listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's show as much as I did. Certainly, if you haven't picked up a copy of Wheat Belly, do it. It's a great book. It's a fun listen, a fun read. And uh, Dr. Davis is certainly a, a, a fun writer. He'll get you smiling uh, just like he did on today's podcast. So remember, this week and every week after, eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better.